Come and join us for a very interesting lecture, which um, from our honorable guest, Yaron Brook, who has been before to our university. And um, that was last time he celebrated my father's birthday and uh, gave a very interesting lecture on the morality of capitalism. And uh, today, I think it might be even more interesting lecture on the topic of equal doesn't mean fair or equal is unfair. Um, I think you have a book, right? With yes, the, the book is called title. Equal is Unfair. Equal is yes. Unfair, yeah. So um, I think that Yaron is one of the, I would say, top of the people who, who talk about liberty and is probably in the top like five. <laughs> <laughs> people are looking in. <laughs> um, top five people who are really kind of um, libertarian, famous libertarian thinkers. So it is a great honor to welcome you here tonight. And Thank you. Um, good luck, I, I'm sure, and I hope that it will be a great lecture. Thank you. Okay, so a few words between you and interesting lecture. So our thanks go to uh, Georgian Students for Liberty, on, on whose events we a little bit parasite. Yeah. Uh, this time was not special invitation for Jan, which does not make this event less important, but we have to thank them for, for s supporting uh, our idea to have Jan today in this audience. So one announcement we will have tomorrow, although it's a f I mean, holiday, uh, also at uh, 3.30 lecture by Matt Kibi, which is also quite I think quite interesting. I never met him, but I read his book, and I think it's also quite provocatively interesting. So please, if you, if you want to attend, so plan it for tomorrow. And I think uh, despite that it's based on, on the book, so this lecture has very interesting context now in Georgia because we are in the presidential election campaign and everybody is speculating on equality, on fairness and so on. And we have many different interpretations what equality is and what fairness is and what is uh, the e equation between equality and fairness. And uh, we mostly see that I think it's, it's inverse uh, <laughs> correlation than, than, than I, Yaron will be presenting, so I assume, and I think I'm <laughs> I think you quite, quite, quite <laughs> certain in my assumption. So thank you very much once more for thank being you. with us, and um, please, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always good to be back in, uh, in Georgia and back at Free University. Thank you all for coming on this uh, drizzly, rainy day. Um, so inequality, inequality is this big topic. For the last 10 years at least, uh, almost every problem in the world has been blamed on inequality. Uh, the economy is not growing very fast. Well, it's because of inequality. There's terrorism. Well, it's because of inequality in the Middle East. There's global warming because there's, I don't know, inequality somewhere, somehow, by somebody. Inequality, I mean, there was a period where you, you open up the New York Times in America, and inequality was the, at the headline of five, six different stories where it was being blamed on things going on in the world. So I want to talk about what inequality is. Is it a problem? And why do people obsess so much about it? So what is inequality? And I'm actually going to take this jacket off because it's warm in here. What is inequality? It's basically the gap, the difference between what, let's say, the poor people, poor people in a society make, and rich people in a society make. Or some cases, it's the difference between what middle class people make and what the rich make. It depends on different measures. And there's even a measurement in economics. We have a measurement called the Gini coefficient which tries to capture the steepness of the difference between those who are at the bottom in terms of income and those who are at the top in terms of income. 
And there was a whole book written about this. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was a big seller in Georgia because it was a big seller everywhere in the world. It was a book by a, a guy named Thomas Piketty. Right, anybody here? Thomas Piketty is a famous French economist. Economist is a little bit of a stretch, but you know he, he's got all the degrees that make him an economist. Um, and it's called, you know, it's called um, Capital in the 21st Century. And he has this whole, he, he does all these, uh, he takes all these numbers and he churns them out and he shows how inequality was really high in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Then it shrunk. And now recently it's just gone way up. And, it, and, and he says, this is a huge problem. Why is it a problem? Because, you know, it comes up with all kinds of statements, but he doesn't prove anything. He doesn't show anything. The main problem is, the main problem is it's not fair. It's just not fair that some people make so much more and that this gap is bigger than it's ever been before, or so at least he claims. What's interesting, just as an aside, why do you think it shrunk at the beginning of the 20th century? Inequality was very high. The gap between the poor and the rich was very high in the, um, in the beginning of the 20th century, and then it shrunk. Why do you think it shrunk? Because of? War. Because of wars. Right? World War I and World War II shrunk inequality. Why? Everybody was trying to survive, so what happened to wealth? Well, we blew it up. Right? Wars blow wealth up. Wars destroy wealth. They destroy buildings. Buildings are wealth. They destroy factories. Factories are wealth. And they destroy money. They destroy wealth. They destroy capital. So yes, inequality shrunk because people died. Wealth was destroyed. We blew stuff up. There's nothing good about that. So, and he admits it. He says it's because of the war. And then he, you know, it doesn't matter to him. Right? It's a good period. Because inequality was lower. The economies do well during war. The economies do well during war. Well, if you measure it by GDP, GDP is the, is the usual way in which you measure economic growth then economic growth sometimes goes up during a war because GDP includes government spending. And government spending goes up during the war, but what does government spending go up to do? To blow stuff up. Right? And blowing stuff up is not good for economies. There's a famous fallacy in economics, maybe the most important fallacy in economics ever. I don't know, I don't know if you read uh, uh, Economics in One Lesson. Do they... It's a great book. If you haven't read Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, it, it should be required reading in every economics class because it's, it's simply written and it, it illustrates this one fallacy in economics and it's called the broken window fallacy. You ever heard about the broken window? Who's heard of the broken window fallacy? Okay, we've got a few. So this is the fallacy. I want to create some economic activity. So I find some kids and I give them rocks and I go tell them to smash windows at businesses. They take the rocks and they throw the rocks and they smash the baker's window. Now this is great because now the baker has to replace the window. She has to go to the guy who makes windows and he buys a new window and the guy who makes new windows has to go and he gets the supplies and he I don't know how to make windows, but he makes a new window and then he has to hire somebody and the person has to install the window and you've got economic activity. All these people are doing stuff. Is that good for the economy? Should we get kids smashing windows? But there's economic activity. GDP went up. Consumption went up. What are we, what's, what's wrong here? Because it feels wrong, right? But what's wrong here? We're looking at dollars and not the products. But think about it this way. We're looking at the end result. The end result is what? We have exactly the same thing as we had before we broke the window. We've got a window. 
So we added nothing in terms of wealth. We added nothing in terms of actual production. We had a window. We've got a window. And in the meantime, a lot of people did a lot of busy work to create something that already existed before. So we're actually less well off economically. But the fallacy is, as you said, it follows the money. Where was the money going to go if the baker didn't have to spend it on the window? What would he have done with the, with the money? What would he have done with the money? Spend it on something else. So there would have been economic activity to provide that thing that he would have spent somewhere else. What if he'd left it in the bank? Right? A lot of us just leave our money in the bank. What would have happened then? What's that? He would have got a percentage, but what, the money would have just sat there. Right? No, what does the bank do with the money? Yeah, it lends it to somebody who is then buying stuff or is then building stuff or creating stuff. So it's not that money just sits in your mattress. Nobody puts money in the mattress. It's at a bank, and a bank lends it out to businesses and to consumers who then spend it and who create economic activity. So instead of people creating economic activity to get more, all we did was replace a window that already existed with a new window. We did nothing. That's what wars do, was blow stuff up. And then we said, hey, there's lots of economic activity because we have to rebuild. But we had it before, and we blew it up. So wars are always economically bad. They depress economic growth. Anyway, back to inequality. So inequality goes down during war. You know, maybe that's what they, the, the people, you know, worried about inequality really want is they want another war. To help us. They also, go bad, they also go down during what, what else causes inequality to go down other than war? Happened in the early part of the, the uh, uh, 20th century, happened in. Revolution would be more like war, yes, but that, that would be more like a war. But what else that's not violent? What's that? Cold War, yeah, again, more wars, something that's not a war. What's that? Yeah, communism reduces inequality dramatically. We'll talk about that. What else? Well, financial crisis, right? Financial crisis reduces inequality. Why? What happens to your financial crisis primarily? Rich people who own financial assets, what happens to the value of their assets? It goes down. Great Depression reduced inequality significantly because the rich got poorer. It wasn't because the poor got richer. It was because the rich got poorer. And yet, these authors celebrate that. That think it's wonderful that inequality shrunk. So, when do you think inequality, when do you think equality was at its, you know, strongest? When do you think we were most equal? In the Stone Age. Yeah, in the Stone Age, we were all very equal, right? I mean, somebody might have had a bigger stone and somebody had a little stone, but generally they just had stones. So when we are very poor, when everybody is very poor, we're equal. Think about how many people were poor, I mean really poor, 300 years ago in, the, in, in, in Europe, in the West. What percentage of the population was really, really poor 300 years ago? 70, 80. And I'm talking about $2 a day or less. Think about what it would mean to live on $2 a day or less. What percentage, what would you say? 90. I'd say 95. Something about 95% of the population 300 years ago all lived on $2 a day or less. What was inequality like? It was great. It was wonderful. It was the best inequality because there was no inequality. Everybody was equal. And everybody was equal for 100,000 years. Human beings have been equal. We've all been poor. All of us. Dirt poor. Two dollars a day or less poor. For 100,000 years. The same. And then what happened? Then we got an industrial revolution. And we got freedom. And everybody got richer. But some people got richer faster. And faster. And, fa and now we have this massive inequality. But poor people are much, 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 much richer than they were back then. But they're not as rich as rich people. Why do we care? 
Why is that a problem? Because we are poor. So we're jealous. So shouldn't we be worried if we are poor? Then shouldn't the thought in our head be, how do we get rich? Shouldn't that be our concern? Shouldn't that be what we worry about? Shouldn't that what we study? How do you get rich? So how do you get rich? How did those guys who, who got up here really high, how did they get rich? Technology and innovation. So it just happened. How did they get rich? They started companies. I know a ton of people started companies and fail. What's that? I can't hear. They worked hard. Yeah, they worked hard. But I know a lot of people who work hard. I know a lot of poor people who work really, really hard and they stay poor. Or they stay, you know, they're a little better relative. But if, if you're a bricklayer and if you're the best bricklayer in the world and if you work really, really hard at bricklaying, you're still going to be relatively poor relative to the really, really rich guy. How do you get, how do you become a billionaire? They got lucky. We'll let wheel. They just got lucky. It's amazing how these people get lucky again and again and again and again and again. Right? You, 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 we'll get to luck. We'll get to luck later. But what's that? They thought of something no one else thought of. I, 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 I think of stuff no one else thinks of all the time. Nobody, nobody frigging pays me a dime for it. <laughs> they created something other people wanted to buy. So they created something that was valuable to other people. And it was valuable to other people where the other people were willing to pay them more than what it cost them to produce the thing. So they took stuff that existed out there and they recombined it in a way that people were willing to pay them more than it cost them to recombine them. Now, that's how you make money. How do you make a lot of money? I mean, how do you become Bill Gates or, or Jeff Bezos now is the richest man in the world? How do you get that rich? Yeah, you do it on a massive scale. So the way to get super rich is to create something of value that people are willing to pay you more than what it costs you to produce. But how many people? Hundreds of millions of people. Hundreds of millions of people. Now, are those hundreds of millions of people who pay you for the product that you have produced, are they better off or worse off by paying you for the product? Like I always use my iPhone, right? If I buy an iPhone for $1,000, am I worse off for buying it? Or better off for buying it? Better, otherwise, I wouldn't buy it. Right? This iPhone is worth how much to me? More than what it cost me. More than $1,000. Don't tell Apple. But a lot more. A lot more. Tens of thousands of dollars. I just got a text from my wife. I don't know. Makes no sense. All right. <laughs> I think it's in Spanish. She's writing me in Spanish. I live in Puerto Rico, so our life now is in Spanish. But I don't know any Spanish, so she's confused. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I, I was FaceTiming earlier today. And when my kids were little, you could, you could communicate. I mean, I, I wish I had an iPhone when my kids were little. So when I traveled, I could see them every day. I mean, how do you put a number on that? How do you put a value on that? Not to mention the business you can do, that you can stay in touch, you can communicate, you can work wherever, from, ever, all over the world. I can live in Puerto Rico, which I do, on a Caribbean island, and I can work because I have an internet connection anywhere in the world. So the hundreds of millions of people are better off. So think about it. These guys became billionaires by making the world a better place to live by improving the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Not by exploiting them, not by screwing them, but by actually making their lives better. And we know they made their lives better because everybody who bought their product did so voluntarily and was willing to give up money because the product that they got was worth more than the money they gave up. So the world has become richer because these guys have become much richer. Indeed, 
The poor can't get richer unless the rich get much richer. Why? Why does, um, why does a factory worker, a simple factory worker, maybe doesn't have an education, maybe he's not that smart, he's doing a simple job, why does he get paid much more today than he did 50 years ago? Because what? He's making the people at the top more richer? Oh, because he's buying their products. But why is he making more money? Why is he richer? Okay, but he's still just, you know, why, why can he today, why today can he produce? How, how much, what's the basis on which you get paid? That's a good general question. Why do you get paid what you get paid? When you get a job, when you leave, when you leave the university and you go out there and get, somebody pays you, how do, they, how do they decide how much to pay you? There's competition, right? There's how many people can do what you actually do. But what else? How qualified you are, which represents what? What's that? Yeah, at the end of the day, you will get compensated based on how productive you are. On your productivity. If I can produce five widgets an hour, I get paid X. If I can produce 20 widgets an hour, I probably get 5X. 4X. I did the math wrong, right? 4X. I'll get paid more. The more productive I am, the more I produce, the more I'll get paid. Uh, People more productive today than they were 50 years ago. Yeah, much more. Why? What makes people more productive? What increases productivity in the economy? Capital, investment, technology. If I give you a computer, I've made you much more productive. If I give you a robot, I make you much more productive. If I give you electricity, from before there was electricity, you become much more productive. And who gives us this technology and this capital? The guys at the top. The guys with the wealth. The guys who invent stuff. The guys who create stuff. The guys who build stuff. The guys who have imagination. Guys and girls. Right? They're the ones who raise the productivity of labor by investing in labor. So again, they get much richer by making the world a better place for us as consumers, but they also get richer by making us more productive. And if we're more productive, we're producing more stuff for them to be able to sell and make money. Everybody is benefiting. Again, not equally, but that's because we don't contribute equally. The Bill Gates of the world have ideas that actually change the world. Most of us don't. That's why most of us will not be billionaires. To be a billionaire, I mean, assuming you did it honestly, assuming you did it in a free market, right? Big assumptions in the world we live in. But if you become a billionaire, it's because you've made the world a better place around it. Because if you have applied some unique skill, some great idea, some innovation, you have worked really, really, really hard. Because it's not enough to have the idea. I mean, Steve, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos works unbelievable hours and has for 25 years since he started Amazon. But he's also a genius. And he's also had great ideas. And he's also, at every point, this is why I laugh a little bit at the luck, right? When did he get lucky? When he started a bookstore online? When he converted the bookstore online to selling everything online? To when he did cloud computing before anybody realized there was such a thing as cloud computing? When he, you know, uh, which step was the luck? Or is it the case that if we produce, if we work hard, if we use our minds, if we think, if we're engaged in production, we create our own luck. Right. So, inequality is a consequence of how productive we are. It's a consequence of the values we produce for the world, for other people. The more value we produce, the richer we get. 
the less value we produce, the less money we get. If people are not willing to pay a lot of money for the stuff you produce, you're not going to get rich. Like, take, take um, us teachers, right? Those of us who chose to be professors, right? We're never going to get super rich. Never. There's just no way to do it. Now, I guess there's a possibility with technology these days. Maybe you can become really rich, but it's, it's almost impossible. Why? Because we can't reach hundreds of millions of people. We can't teach face-to-face -face with hundreds of millions of people. So each one of us will see thousands of kids. We might have profound impact on you, but the actual value we are producing in the world is limited. And many of us chose that knowing that, right? I could have been a Wall Street guy and make, I've probably given up millions of dollars to do what I'm doing right now. Why? Why would you give up millions of dollars? What's that? Money can buy some happiness, yeah. But so can other stuff, right? Yeah. So the reason you're willing to give up millions of dollars is because life is not about money. It's not about just money. Money's important. Don't get me wrong. Money is great. But life's not about money. Life's about happiness. Life's about having fun. Life's about doing stuff you believe in, doing stuff you enjoy. What I do, this, is worth millions of dollars to me. Nobody's paying me millions of dollars to do it, believe me. But I wouldn't give it up for anything. You could offer me millions of dollars right now and I wouldn't give it up. So the whole obsession about inequality assumes that all we really care about is money. Because some of us have chosen to be poorer than we could have otherwise been. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with those choices. We don't measure somebody's you know, moral worth, worth as a human being based on how much money they have. They've got a lot of money. They've done well in their job. Again, in a free market, assuming they're honest and all that. Right? Good for them. That's wonderful. That's, that's virtuous. That's great. But that's not better at any kind of scale than a great artist or a great teacher or a great anything else who might not have made that much money doing what he's done. But the people who are worried about inequality, it's all they can think of. Everything is material value. Everything is about how much you make. And therefore, if everything is about how much you make, if we get our whole worth as human beings from how much we make, then, you know, we, we don't want to hurt anybody, so we want to make us more equal because we don't want to think that somebody else is better than us. But somebody else is better at us at some things. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody better than you guys at something, right? Making money. But I, for example, I'm, uh, did you play, ba do you guys play basketball in Georgia? You have any famous basketball players? Who's a famous basketball player in Georgia? Who? Does he play in the NBA? All right. What's that? Where, for Golden State? You play for Golden State? Cool. So, if I were you, if I were you, I'd be pretty upset that the fact that there is basketball inequality, right? There's major basketball inequality in the world, right? Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, so I'm going to use LeBron James as an example, right? Everybody know LeBron James? Yeah. Greatest player on the planet right now. Not quite as good as Michael Jordan, but good player, right? LeBron James. I want to be equal with LeBron James in basketball. I want to be able to get on the basketball court with LeBron James and score a basket. And it's okay. I don't even want absolute equality. I just want to have a chance to score a basket. And I can guarantee you. I, have you ever seen LeBron? I mean, he's, I mean, there's just no way I would even get close to the ball. Right? I don't, ha I, you know, and I could practice every day, all day long, all day long, and I still 
wouldn't be able to score a basket on LeBron James. And I'm pretty pissed off. I want basketball equality. So how do we get to the point where I can get on a basketball court with LeBron and score a basket? What do we have to do? What's that? Hinder him. How do we hinder him? How are we going to hinder LeBron James? Well, we can change the rules, but it's basketball. That wouldn't be right. I don't want to change the rules, right? I want to be able to score in basketball. Basketball is this set of rules. So how do we get me to score a basket? I can't. How do I make him allow me to score a thing? How do you, how do, you do that? What's that? How do you make him equal to my skills? Lower the basket. I don't want to change. No, that's cheating, right? I don't want to change the rules. Make the basket that big. See, you're changing the rules. No, there's something. What's that? Man, I, I, this is amazing. This is the first group that hasn't come up with the answer like that, right? How do you, how do you make me and LeBron equal? There we go. Finally. You break his legs. <laughs> and you probably have to break one arm. Because even with broken legs, my suspicion is that I, I, he would beat me, right? The only way to make me and LeBron James equal in basketball is to cripple LeBron James. Tie his hands, break his legs, do something violent to LeBron James. That's the only way. That's how you establish equality. I mean, you can threaten him, but threatening him is the same as breaking his legs, right? You can put a gun to his back and say, don't, don't let your arms score, right? But it's all the same. But that's a really, really important point. The only way to establish equality among people with unequal skills, unequal abilities, unequal talents, unequal motivations, unequal whatever, is to do violence to those who are better. Like, we complain about income inequality. Well, how do we equate incomes? How are we going to equate incomes? What would we have to do to equate incomes? What's, what's Thomas Piketty's solution to income inequality? How do we make it more equal? Yeah, progressive taxes. Now, progressive taxes right now are pretty bad, but he would like it to be much bigger. Right? And he's worried about wealth. So what Piketty's offered is a 10% global wealth tax. So it will be global. Every person in the world would pay it. 10% on your wealth. And he said, it's not going to help the poor much. Because even if you take 10% of everybody's wealth and redistribute it, it's not going to make them a lot richer. But what will it make the rich? A lot poorer. So progressive taxes is how you make it. Now, what are taxes? Like, what are taxes? Punishment for success. What are taxes? That, they take your money, right? They take your money. What, what, is, what is your money? What does money represent? When you earn, earn a paycheck, you get a paycheck, you know, 1,000 euros. What does 1,000 euros represent? Your productivity. What's that? Your, the value that you've exchanged, your time spent, your effort spent. Money represents time. Money represents effort. Money represents your, productive, your productivity. Money represents your life. You spend, you will spend more time at work than in any other place during your lifetime. We all say family is important, but really... I mean, if family was more important, wouldn't we spend more time with our family? But we don't. And there's a reason. Because we gain a lot of self-esteem for work. We challenge ourselves at work. Work should be fun. It should be what we really value. It should be where we want to spend our time. So... When I go to work and I make a thousand euro and then you come and take half of that, what are you taking from me? You're taking my time. You're taking my effort. You're taking my productivity. You're taking my life. You're taking half my life. Half my life I work for the government in California. You guys have low taxes compared to 
Now, in Puerto Rico, it's different, right? I moved to Puerto Rico. That's why I moved to Puerto Rico. So I've gone from, I used to pay 55% taxes. 55. Every $100 that I made, 55 went to the government. That's before sales taxes and all the other garbage. That's just straight taxes, right? Federal and state. 55. Half of all my working life, I work for the government. Now, imagine, now, you know, it's interesting because when you tell an audience we're going to break LeBron James's legs, everybody goes, oh, my God, that's horrible. Nobody would do that. You can't break people's legs. But then I say, I'm going to take 55% of your income. They go, well, yeah, okay, that's, that's okay. And I like, if you came with this proposal to me, you said, every year you're on, you can either pay 55% of your income or we break your legs. What do you prefer? Probably, right? Probably. I can invest that income. It, there's compounded interest. I mean, it's a lot of money. Breaking my legs? Yeah, breaking legs you can fix and buy a really cool w wheelchair, right? I mean, but, but think about it. Taking 55% of your income is doing violence against you. There's no fundamental difference between taxation, where half of your time is taken away from you, and somebody physically assaulting you. It's the same thing. The only way to achieve equality is through violence against those who make more. The only way to achieve equality is to take violently from some and give to others. It's the only way. And that's exactly what's being advocated. That's what the inequality people really advocate for. And again, they say it's not going to help the poor that much. It's not like this is going to raise them that much. Because what really raises, what, what, what helps the poor become middle class? How do we get that? How do we get poor people becoming middle class people? By being more productive. By creating more value. That's how you become middle class and rich. But this hasn't done that. So all you're doing is redistributing. And you're taking money from rich people. What do the rich people do with the money? If I, if I wasn't taxed at 55%, which I'm not anymore because in Puerto Rico my taxes now are 4%. All in, lower than Georgia even, 4%. So what am I doing with the extra money now I have? My, my income has doubled. What do I do with the extra money? Yeah, I invest it. I don't consume it. I invest it. And what does investment do? What is investment? What's the nature of investment? It creates more wealth. And how does it create more wealth? By investing it, which is investment in capital, which ultimately increases the productivity of labor, which raises wages. And it raises production, and it raises all of our wealth. So now we're stealing that money from them, redistributing, not helping the poor that much because there's just not enough money to help them that much. So what is the real goal of people who constantly harp on the problems of inequality? It's not to help the poor. The best way to help the poor is to, is to encourage more investment, which lower taxes would do. What's their real motivation? Political gain because they're playing on our emotion. But what is part of actually why it works? Why does it work on our emotions? Because what is the goal of all this? What is the goal of this whole scheme? What's that? Health care? How did healthcare come into this? I don't know where healthcare came from. What's that? Yeah, they're not. You, no, they're, we're talking about redistribution, not not what they're going to use the taxes for. Redistribution. We can talk about healthcare in the Q and A if you want. What's the motivation? Yeah, but it's not really because quality. But why? The real motivation is to knock the people at the top down. The real motivation is hatred of LeBron James. Not of LeBron James, but the LeBron Jameses of business. The LeBron Jameses of wealth. The real motivation is we don't like them. We want to pull them down. Because it doesn't help us pulling them down. It's not my motivation to make my life better. It's just to see them knocked down. It's pure envy. It's pure hatred. Ayn Rand, 
Ayn Rand, who you should all read, Ayn Rand defined envy as hatred of the good for being the good. It's hatred of people with money because they had the talent and skill to make that money. It's just wanting to see people crushed. And it's evil. So in my view, the people advocating for equality are advocating for destruction. They were advocating for violence. They're advocating for the destruction of the good, of the productive, of the people who make the world wealthy, that make the world rich, the people who make the iPhones possible, make the internet possible, make our lives, our modern lives possible. We want to penalize them. Why? Because they were successful. Because we hate successful people. We hate LeBron James. Now, nobody hates LeBron James. Why, Why do you think in sports it's different? There are two areas in life where we don't resent wealth. Sports and entertainment. Why? Well, you need talent in every one of these endeavors. But the difference is that in basketball and in entertainment, we know, we understand what the talent is. So all of us have played basketball. We've all gone and shot a hoop, right? And then we watch LeBron James going, whoa, that's amazing. Because we all can experience it. We, we, we know it. We've done it ourselves. We've all tried to sing a song. And then we watch, uh, who? Um, Lady Gaga. I said Lady Gaga, not you. Supposedly she's really good in this new movie, A Star is Born. So uh, she's got an amazing voice. And we watch her and we go, whoa, that's amazing. And because we can associate with that skill and that talent, because we've tried to do it, we say, okay, we understand, okay, they deserve it in some way. But what does a CEO do? What does an innovator do? What does a Jeff Bezos do? Most of us have no clue. And we resent it. Plus, it's about money. And we believe somehow that when Apple makes iPhones, they're exploiting us. That's a belief that's common among people. That business is exploiting their customers. That our lives are not improving. We bought into a zero-sum view of the world. But it's not. My life's better. Everybody, the entire supply chain's life is better because of an iPhone. Think about inequality this way. If you take a group of people, like the people in this room, and you put them on an island, free, you leave them alone. No redistribution of wealth, no regulations, no controls. You know, you can't, you can't hit each other. You can't kill each other. You can't steal from each other. But basically, you can do whatever you want. How many of you think that if I come back five years later, we're all the same? Everybody's equal. Everybody exactly the same. It ain't happening. Look around the room. We're all completely different. We all have different skills, different talents, different abilities, different desires, different passions. We all want different things. We all find different things interesting. I mean, that's what makes the w world so beautiful. If we were all the same, it would be boring, even if everybody was like me, exactly. It would be terrible. I mean, the fact that we're all so different, the fact that we're all so diverse, to use a politically correct term, right, is amazing. Not the diversity of something stupid like skin color. Who cares? But the diversity of our values, the diversity of our thinking, the diversity of who we are and what we are and what we can do. There's a LeBron James and there's a Jeff Bezos. How rich is that? How do riches make our life? So if you take a bunch of people and leave them free, they will be unequal. Some people will choose to be teachers. Some people will produce the best, I don't know, fishing nets on this island. Some people will just like going out there and, you know, using an old rod and, and fish one fish at a time because they're just keeping it cool and they don't want to exert all the effort required in mass production of fish or whatever, right? We'll all make our own individual choices, and we'll all be unequal. 
The only way then to establish equality is to take from those who have. It's to steal from those who have, to break people's legs, to do violence on some. And that is wrong. That is always wrong. Because there is one concept of equality that means something, that I'm a big advocate of. So I believe in equality. The Founding Fathers of America, in the Declaration of Independence, I think the most important political document ever written, in that document they say all men are created equal. I mean, they didn't mean it. Let's put that aside, right? There were slaves. Women didn't count and all that. But the intention, right? The idea is the right idea. We're all created equal. But what does that mean? What does that mean that we're all equal? We weren't exactly created. But anyway, we're all equal. Yeah. What did they mean by it? I don't think it's an illusion. Not the way they meant it. Because they didn't mean equal outcome. They didn't mean equal wealth. They didn't mean equal income. What equality did they mean? What's that? Equality of rights. We're all equal in our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're all equal, equally free. We're all born free. We're all born with the protection of the law equally applied to us. We all have a right to live our lives as we see fit. To go out there and pursue the values we believe for ourselves. Make it possible for us to survive and to thrive and to be successful as human beings. At whatever level we do it. We have a right to be free of... What does freedom mean? Freedom's a, a cool word. Everybody likes freedom. But what does it actually mean? Freedom is what? Whatever you want now. Freedom doesn't mean whatever you want. Freedom's control of yourself when you're weak. Nope. Freedom doesn't mean taking responsibilities. When, 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 I don't know. When... Um, when we fight for freedom, what are, what are we fighting for? We can call freedom whatever we want, so it doesn't mean anything? So what does the word mean? Nothing? Yeah, that's psychological freedom. That's not political freedom. What do we mean by political freedom? Yeah, not to be controlled. Freedom, the literal definition of freedom is the absence of coercion, the absence of force, the absence of somebody pulling a gun and telling you what you can and cannot do, the absence of authority that tells you you have to think this way and no other way is possible. We're all born equally free. We all have a right to live our lives free of coercion, free of force, free of authority, to make our own judgments about how we should live our lives, about which values we as individuals should pursue. That's the sense that we are free. That's the sense that we are equal. We're equal in our freedom. Now notice that in order to become equal in the other sense, in a sense of equality of wealth or equality of, uh, of income, what do we have to do to equality of freedom? We have to violate it. What do we have to do to equality before the law? We have to violate it. The rich guys have to pay more. We have to take from some and give to others. We have to do violence. We have to use coercion. So the only way to fix, in quotes, Equality of outcome or equality of wealth, of any kind of outcome, is to destroy equality of rights. It's to destroy freedom. Inequality, inequality, the gap. Inequality is a feature of freedom, not a bug. It's a feature of freedom, 
not a bug. And in that sense, to the extent that it is generated from freedom, it should be celebrated, not, you know, not fought. If inequality is a sign that we're free, which it often is, then it's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's fantastic. It's an expression of the fact that we're different. It's an expression of the fact that we have different abilities, different skills, different motivations, different values. So inequality is a feature of freedom. Freedom is something we should always celebrate. So... <laughs> So ignore all those people who tell you equality or violence is fair. There's nothing fair about doing violence against other people. There's nothing fair about treating people unjustly. There's nothing fair about not treating them equally before the law or not respecting their rights to their own property and to the stuff that they make. Equality of outcome is unfair. All right, thanks. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Yep. Use the mic there, he's giving you a mic. Okay. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, so you said that 55% of your money, of your life, and or, of your time goes to the uh, government. So yep. uh, in Puerto Rico, there is 4%. Uh, my question is that how can a strong country exist when there is so low taxes? Because as I know, California is much stronger than Puerto Rico. Yeah, not, not because of taxes, though. No, um, okay. <laughs> not because of taxes, because of Microsoft and because of Facebook and because of all the tech companies who were established in Silicon Valley. And that is a large extent because of Stanford University, which is a private university in the middle of Silicon Valley. And the original people who started Silicon Valley were Hewlett Packard and other private companies. And then there was the venture capital community, which is private money. So. No, I, I don't think a I don't think I don't think you need high taxes in order to be a strong country. What do you mean by strong country? It means big weapons? You mean a big economy? I think California would be ten times richer if it had a four percent tax. Now, most of the taxes in California you pay to the federal government, you don't pay to the California government. But no, taxes don't produce a strong economy. What produces a strong economy are individual entrepreneurs and businessmen creating wealth. And individual in, I, I, entrepreneurs and businessmen creating wealth need an environment in which their rights are protected, in which there's a system of laws that protects their property rights. Let them invest, make choices, let them fail, and learn from those failures. Because when we bail people out, they don't learn from their failures. Let them fail. It's a system that allows for people to make a lot of money, to be successful. And it's a system that doesn't regulate, doesn't control. And if you do that, what you get is wealth creation and entrepreneurship and innovation and success. And that's how you get a strong com uh, country. S countries don't become wealthy because of government. The only job of government the only legitimate job of government is to protect our individual rights, protect us from crooks and criminals and thieves. What resource? Where does money come from? I can print as much money as you want. I've got, you know, I've got a friend at the central bank. Where does, where do, what resources do you need? Uh, we uh, we pay money to gov uh, government, and government do many stuff to help us. Improve. It does what? What does it do to help you? Uh, to create good environment for me to just improve my skills or something like this well, to help others. Maybe. How does it do it? Tell me what it does. Government do a lot of stuff, maybe funding uh, uh, 
educational, uh, for, for example, school do you know, Do you know what income taxes? The United States of America in 1776 was a poor country. It was a colony of, the, of, the, of, of England, and they, England didn't really care that much. They didn't even fight the war. So America became independent, right? A poor country. What, from 1776 until 1914, 1914 America was the largest, strongest economy in the world. What, what, what was the income taxes in the United States between that period of time? What was the income tax rate between 1776 and 1914? The rate of income taxes. It was zero. Zero. And it became the biggest country in the world. How much did government spend creating this environment that helps you so much? How much did government spend as a percent of GDP? How much did the federal government in the United States, excluding the Civil War, so n in peacetime, did the federal government in the United States spend as a percentage of GDP during that period? Today it spends about 21%. How much did it spend back then? About 3%. So it was tiny, tiny government. And the economy went from being a third-rate colony that Britain w didn't even fight for to being the largest economy in the world by far. Strongest, militarily, economically, and everything. With zero taxes, zero income taxes, and almost no government spending. All the stuff you need to be successful in life is made by private enterprise. Okay, so the government's only function is to protect us. Police, military, okay. and an ju independent judiciary. That's it. Okay. Don't need a government to do, uh, to do anything else. I, I'll give you one other example because people would say, oh, but America had natural resources. They had gold and they had oil and they had all this stuff. Well, think about Hong Kong. Anybody ever been to Hong Kong? Nobody been? Oh, one, yeah, two. All right, everybody should be in Hong Kong. Everybody should go to Hong Kong at least once in your life before the Chinese destroy it. So you might have 10, 15 years now to get to Hong Kong, right? Hong Kong is one of the most stunning places on the planet. It has more skyscrapers than New York City. Seven and a half million people live in this place. It's a rock in the middle of nowhere. No natural resources. No oil, no gold, no natural gas, nothing. It's just a rock. An island. It's got a port. That's the best you can think of in terms of natural resources. 70 years ago, 70 years ago, there was a fishing village in Hong Kong. Today, 7.5 million people live there. Average GDP per capita, so they take the GDP of the island divided by the number of people, higher than the United States. It took them 75 years to become richer than America, what America took 250 years. What does the government do there? Very little. It, has a it, it doesn't have a military. It has a police force. It has a judiciary system. They respect property rights. They respect contracts. And they leave you alone. And poor people from all over Asia got on boats and they swam and they jumped over fences and they did anything, risked their lives to get there. Not to get free health care. Not to get subsidies. Not to get stuff from the government. But to get what? Starts with an F. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom is what produces the goods. Freedom is why we're rich. Without freedom, we lose everything. So when the government starts regulating this and controlling that and taxing there and giving you stuff over here, that means freedom is shrinking and long term you will become, you will become less rich than you could have been if you were free. Yeah, although I agree that uh, government shouldn't regulate as uh, firmly as uh, like totalitarian one, I uh, I want to ask you what about China? It's one of the fastest growing economics in the world, and uh, it's government controlled. So what about China? It's a good question. So I recommend a book. It's a it's a short book. It's called How China Became Capitalist. I don't believe China did become capitalist, but anyway, the title's wrong. But the book is really good. Um, it was written by a guy named, uh, economist by the name of Ronald Coase, who is one of the most famous economists. Uh, he wrote it when he was 101 years old with a Chinese co-author. So all of us should, uh, should uh, live to be that long. And um, it's brilliant because he shows how that happened. So how did China become rich? China became rich, relatively rich, because it left 
whole sections of its economy unregulated. And those are the parts of the economy that became rich. So for example, right after Mao died, right, uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power. And he went to, to Japan and he went to Hong Kong and he said, whoa, they're so far ahead of us. Maybe there's something, this capitalist stuff, right? So what he did is he, he went to the region around Hong Kong and he said, you guys, we're going to just leave you alone. You basically can do whatever you want. We're not going to interfere. Let's see what happens. I don't know. Maybe it'll work in, in, in China, right? So you can pretend there's private property. You can have contracts. You can do all these things. Communism is not going to apply to you. And within a few years, the place was booming. So he said, ah, okay, so we'll do the same thing in Shanghai, and we'll do the same thing here. Not everywhere in China, but there are regions in China where they did this, and those regions took off. I'll give you one of the, I'll give you one of the example of China. Um, during the 1960s, about 40 to 60 million Chinese died of starvation because of collectivized farming. How did collectivized farming end? Because it ended, because they're not starving anymore. So there was this little village, this is a true story, it, it always amazes me, but you can, you can look it up on Google, but there was, a little, there was a little village in the middle of China that they were starving. They literally were sending their children to the, to the city to beg for money so that they could buy a little bit more food because they weren't producing enough food to feed themselves. And the Communist Party was upset at them because they weren't meeting their quotas. And here they were, they're starving. So the village got together in 1978. And they all got together in a town hall. And they said, okay, what are we going to do? They said, okay, we're going to try this thing. Don't tell anybody. It's secret, right? You, you take that piece of land, and you can, you can do whatever you want there, right? And anything beyond the quotas that we have to send to the commune, you get to keep, or you get to sell, and you get to keep the proceeds. And you have this piece of land. In other words, they created pseudo-private property. Everybody had their own piece of land. And they went, and everybody did it, and guess how much food they had the following year? The same as in the past, when they were collectivized and everything was commonly owned? How much more? Or less. Six times more. Six times more private property versus collective. Same plots of land, same area, same area, six times more. The Communist Party looked at this and said, whoa, what's going on here? Maybe we've solved our problem. So they sent their officials down, and of course nobody in the village wanted to talk, but finally they got one of them to talk, and they discovered that they'd used private property. And they freaked out. And there were, there were communist officials who wanted to kill everybody in the village because they didn't want this to spread, right? And Deng Xiaoping was a very pragmatic guy. He said, no, 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 it works. Let's try it in another village. And it worked there too. And that's how they privatized, privatized in quotes because it's not real private, but it's pseudo-private, all the farming in China, and that's why they have food. And that happened everywhere the government touches, state-owned enterprises, that's where you get shrinkage, not success. Yes, but China helps entrepreneurs in, uh, in China. Like, uh, Chinese government helps uh, yeah, Chinese entrepreneurs with financially, no? Very little. Very little. The big entrepreneurs, the Alibabas of the world, yeah. got zero from the Chinese government. Zero. I mean, now they do. So what China, unfortunately, what's happened in China is that in 2008, now China's never been completely free. China has lots of problems, right? And China growth has come down significantly. But part of the reason for that is in 2008, they looked at the West, and they decided the financial crisis was caused by capitalism, which it was not. You can ask me about that, but it wasn't. They decided it was, and they said, we're going to uh, take a step back from capitalism. And what they become is much more involved in the economy, much more controlling, much more regulations, much more help entrepreneurs. And the result of that has been slower economic growth, not faster economic growth. A lot of countries help entrepreneurs, but what you don't have is a comparison if, if they didn't help the entrepreneurs. It's not clear. I mean, there's a lot of economic evidence that the help that they provide is negative value, not positive value. So I would not encourage governments to help entrepreneurs. What, what do governments know about venture capital? Venture capital is hard. I did it for a while. I tried. I invested in a bunch of little companies. You know how much money I made? 
I lost a lot of money. Other people's money, but I lost a lot of money. I made, you know, I, I, a net I made the money. But, but it, you know, I don't know anything about it. It's hard. And I was a finance professor, and I studied it, and really, but the skill to be a great venture capitalist is like one in a billion. It's, it's the very few great venture capitalists in the world. Now give it to a bunch of government bureaucrats. There's no way they're going to do a good job at it. The best thing government can do to investment is never do it. Yeah, we got a question over here. And in the back afterwards. One of the, one of the, the most uh, common uh, argument for progressive tax, uh, which, which I think makes sense, is that actually um, uh, the companies, the, the rich people, use society as, as the resource. So that means uh, so without the society, they cannot make that amount of money. So as, for example, the raw materials are the resource for the company, as is the society, as people. So therefore, uh, paying uh, more uh, to the society is uh, fear because they owe more to the society. Yeah. What do you have to say against it? But don't tell me that flat, ta flat tax also means that you pay more. Uh, I'll tell you that as well. <laughs> no, I, actually I, think rich people, <laughs> I actually think rich people should pay less taxes than middle class people. The reasons? Because they, they, they contribute more to society than middle class people do. I mean, Jeff Bezos has changed the world. He's made the world a better place for billions of people. He has changed how we think about shopping. He's changed how we think about our lives. He's really had a profound impact. Now, what resources did he use? Now, now this is the other thing. I think they use less resources on net. What resources did they use? Give me an example of a resource. Okay, no, no, they say no. Okay, Jeff now give me an Bezos example a of a resource that rich people use that other people don't. No, no, that's the different point of the argument. This is a different point. Of so I'm tell me, you said I'm they use resources. Without, without people, without us. Yeah, uh, without people. us. So what do we get in, in return for the help we give, like employees, right? Without employees, they wouldn't get rich. So what happens to employees? They get paid. They get paid. You want a job at Amazon. I mean, you don't want a job in the warehouse, maybe, at Amazon. But I have friends who work at Amazon. You want a job at Amazon. They get paid well. They get paid really well. If they do a good job, they get exceptionally well. So what resource have I used? Every resource, every resource a rich person, honest, in a free market, uses, he pays for. People, they get paid for. Now, you could say he couldn't get rich unless we bought his product. Yes, but we're buying his product because it's making our lives better. So what resources the businessman used that he didn't pay for? I mean, I think Apple should feel, I think Apple needs to be compensated for the fact that I paid $1,000 for something that I think is worth $30,000. They got screwed. I, from the trade between me and Apple, who won more? It's not even close. I did. They made, on this thing, they made a profit of maybe $500. What's my profit? Tens of thousands of dollars equivalent of. I mean, we have to completely reverse the way we think about business. Business contributes far more than it pays. Far more. It creates jobs. Where, where were we all before there were businesses? Where did we, what did we all do? What did humanity do before there was businesses? We farmed. Little farms called subsistence farming. How much profit did we make from that farming? Zero. It's called subsistence farming because we basically grew the stuff we ate. We had, on average, for 100,000 years, $2 a day or less. And then business came into the world. And we all got rich. We all got rich. There's not a person, even in Georgia, maybe in Georgia, but who's not richer than a subsistence farmer 300 years ago. We're richer. Because even, even a simple farmer today has an iPhone. Maybe not in Georgia. In America, everybody has an iPhone. Or an equivalent, Samsung or something. Who, did, who was exploited? 
Who is taking advantage of? The Chinese workers, I always get the question, in, particularly in Western Europe, particularly from rich kids. What about the Chinese workers that assemble the iPhones? Aren't they being exploited by Apple? Yeah, right? Nobody forced the Chinese workers to go into the factories. Why did they go to the factories to assemble the iPhone? Because they get paid. They get paid more or less than the alternative jobs that they have. More, otherwise they wouldn't take this job. Did they get paid more or less than what they made when they were on the, on the farm in the middle of China? They make more, a lot more. They used to make less, right? Not only did they make more, now for us it's like ridiculous, they only get, I don't know, five dollars, ten dollars a day or something. You know, for us it's like, whoa, they're so poor. But they have enough money to send money back to the farm to help their parents. And they're learning a skill. And within a few years, they, get, they become more productive. And what happens when you become more productive? Your wages go up. And they make more money and more money. And some of them become middle class. Today, in China, there are hundreds of millions of people who are middle class, not poor anymore. How did they become middle class? Because they started out with simple jobs and worked their way up. So no, there's no exploitation going on in the system. There's no losers in the system. I mean, the people fail, but that's not losing. It's not the same. There's no resources that people, that the rich people take. People say, oh, they use the roads. Well, we all use the roads. But where do roads come from? Like infrastructure, roads and... What's that? Where do yeah. So what do you think comes first? Wealth creation or roads? What comes first? Wealth creation, because otherwise where do you get the money to build the roads? And who built the first roads before governments took them away from them? Businessmen built the, built the first roads. They had to move their product from point A to point B, so they built a road. And then, they, and then they built canals in America. They built canals. So because shipping was faster than horse, you know, horses. And then what did the government do? Oh, that's a good idea. We're going to take over the canals. We're going to take over the roads. And we're going to build the infrastructure. And we're going to tax you for that. So everything business uses, it pays for. They're not exploiting anything. Who's next? Uh, yeah. Yeah, first, first of all, thank for your time. Uh, secondly, it always starts kind of controversy whenever I say this, but I really want to ask. You mentioned well, violence is bad, like evil, right? What is? Violence is evil. Violence is evil, yes. Yeah, uh, but the question is, like, what is left for the poor ones we, who are appalled by the rich? What is left for the poor ones now, who are what? Uh, uh, when the rich is appalling them. Like, I don't want to write the... Uh, when the rich? Uh, like, uh, bullied by the rich. Yeah, How do the rich bully the poor? Uh, yeah, I don't want to, like, write the... Terrorist act, but what is left for the poor people? What should they do? They should work. They should what? Work. Get a job. Nah, like uh, they are bullied in an unfair way. Like Bali is unfair itself, but more unfair way. I can't understand his accent. I'm sorry. Okay, that's my Italian American accent. Sorry, uh, I'll, I'll repeat. So, what should the poor people do when they are bullied by the rich ones, by the people with the power? I don't understand the question because I don't understand where the bullying is. So uh, if, 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 uh, if, they, if, if you don't want to buy an iPhone, don't buy an iPhone. I'm not talking about buying the product they produce. So how are you bullied? Uh, like uh, if government bothers people. Government bothers people? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so let's replace the government. Okay. That's a good, uh, but that's great. Uh, I want freedom. I want a government that doesn't bully people. I want government that doesn't control people, that doesn't regulate people, that doesn't tell people how to live, that doesn't tax people, a government that leaves people alone. Yeah, I understand that, but Mark Twain said uh, people shouldn't be allowed to vote because people are stupid. Most of the people. Did I say people shouldn't be allowed to vote? Yeah, no, not you. Mark Twain said. Oh, uh, Mark Twain. Mark yeah, Twain is so a funny guy, is, and he wrote a no, lot no, of comedy. The meaning is, the way I'm trying to tell is that there are like little people who really understand this situation. I mean, I don't think, look, I don't, I, I, I'm not, sh I don't think people should, it's not about an issue of allowed to vote. People should be allowed to vote. I don't think they should be allowed to vote on anything important. 
<laughs> okay, government is really because, important. Because, no, because I believe in a government. I believe what we need is to start over with government and make government so limited, so constrained, so impotent, so weak that it doesn't matter who's in charge that much, right? Because they can't do very much. So I want the government not to be involved in economics. No regulations, no controls, no investments, no helping entrepreneurs, nothing in the economy, zero. No redistribution of wealth, no welfare, nothing. And then it's okay. We can vote who's going to be president, but the president can't do very much. That's the kind of government I believe in, in a government that can't do very much. And then they can't bully people. They can't force people to do things they don't want to do, which means a government that respects our freedom, the government that leaves us alone. That's the kind of government we, we want. And how do we get that? We only get that by educating people about the value of such a government so that they fight for a government like that. They advocate for a government like that, and in the end, vote for a government like that maybe one day. But, uh, you as well said that there is gap between people. There is gap between Bill Gates and us. They yeah. think different way. Not many people think in a correct why way. Do I, wh why do you care that there's a gap between you and Bill Gates? Uh, I don't because, care. Yeah, I, I think there is an intellectual gap between people. There's definitely an intellectual gap between yeah, both. Yeah. Like Bill Gates is much more corrupt than I am intellectually. Even though he's smarter than me, he, he's wrong on most intellectual issues. Yeah, maybe he was born that way. Maybe he was ro raised a different way. But the reality is that people don't really think like most of the people. I, I still don't get the question, I guess. Now the question is that, like, uh, if we take a hundred person and we give them the same uh, bad situation, like bad lifestyle, only maybe like 10 or 5 per person will get up and say, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Maybe like 90 others will feel the same, but they don't want to do anything to change it. They don't want to see it and tell, I don't like this. But the, those five people will get up and fight for it. But five people can't fight a millions. So the only uh, thing only thing is left is like terror attacks, violence. So what that what is left else? So all change, all cultural change is brought about by minorities, not by majorities. It's the five who get up and fight that make a difference, not the ninety percent who sit on their butts and do nothing. If you think of every how how many how many communists were in Russia when the communists had their communist revolution. How many people believed in communism in a country of a hundred and something million people Phew. in 1917? Almost nobody. Yeah. Almost nobody. It's the people who act. It's the people who think. It's the people who speak. It's the people who educate. It's the people who believe. It's the people who are passionate that make a difference. The vast majority of people won't make one iota of a difference to the fate of the world. Minorities change the world. Now minorities are one, but you know you have to have a few people who agree with you. Like you know, I'm working on that. But yeah. there was another question. So yeah, one last uh, actually. Uh, so we also mentioned America meant uh, like every man is born equal, right? Supposedly, yes. Yeah, so the question is, like, is, are they really, like, a boy born in New Orleans is, born, is as equal as, like, someone who born in the sur suburbs in New York? Like yes, in the sense that they're both born free. They should be the same, whether, whether the legal system practices that or not is a, is a question. But the ideal is that we're all born equal in rights. We're all free. We're all... Uh, as equal, uh, uh, we're all eligible for the same protection from the government, no matter where we are born, no matter the color of our skin, no matter our gender, no matter our sexual orientation or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we all have the same rights. That's the, that's the ideal. Practicing that ideal is not easy, and, and it, you know, it's hard. But that's the only job of politicians, is to make sure we're all treated equally, in that sense. Not equal education. We have different genes, we have different educations, we have different parents, we have different, so there's a lot of things. Equal in rights, equal in freedom. Okay. All right, we have a question here. The mic is coming. Uh, what do you think, is taking revenge fair? What? Taking revenge, is it fair or not? Maybe you, uh, you came to me and broke my legs. 
then I uh, broke your legs a couple yes. of days after. Is yes. it fair that I took revenge? Oh, revenge. Okay, I didn't understand the middle word. Do I think revenge is fair? In a sense, yes. I mean, it's justice, right? But it's not your job to commit the revenge. This is the one thing we have government for. What we do is when we want to form civilized societies, is we come together and have a monopoly over the use of force. And it is now the agency responsible for justice. So instead of you breaking my legs and then me running after you with no legs, I guess my wheelchair running after you, and breaking your legs, I assign that responsibility to the government. The government catches you, and it doesn't literally break your legs because we don't believe in an eye for an eye anymore, but it puts you in jail, right? Now, it puts you in jail as an act of justice because you did something bad and something bad is done to you. And if you break somebody's legs, you go to five years in jail, and if you kill him, you go for the rest of your life in jail. Uh, although if you break your, their legs, maybe you should go for longer. But so it's it's proportional to the to the to, to the bad thing that you had committed. So, so that's the one root job job of government is to is to execute justice for us. Okay, so uh, me breaking your legs after you broke mine is fair, but it's not right. Yes. It's fair, not, but not well, right. it's, it's not right in a civilized society. If we lived in a jungle, yes, that's exactly would be fair and would be right. But in a civilized society, it's not how we execute justice because we don't want people to be vigilantes. We don't want people to go and executing their own justice in their own way. I'm not an anarchist. I believe, I believe that is the one job of government is to, is to be an objective applier of what justice is and what justice means. But there is punishment. Punishment is legit. Yep. Pass the mic. Or, oh, there's a mic behind you. There's another mic there. Uh, talking about talking about the freedom. This freedom for us Georgians that we talk about is like an illusion. So, what do you think is the first step we, maybe students or even the government, could do to, uh, you know, be a little bit, little bit closer to their freedom? Well, I mean, the first thing you need to do is educate yourself about what it means and about why it's a value and why it's important and how it functions. After that, you have to speak up. You have to advocate for it. There's no shortcuts in life. There are no shortcuts. You have to be part of that minority that will ultimately bring change. But the change has to come through education, through, through increasing your numbers, through ultimately gaining political, political power. Oh, what should government do today? How would government can do or could do that this freedom could be like more reachable to us? Yeah, but government doesn't want you to be free. If government wanted to be free, what would be the problem? It's easy. Yeah, but what could be done? What do you think could be done? Well, fire most of the people who work for the government, yeah, right? Get rid of the regulations. Um, what do you have? A, what's your flat tax in Georgia? 20%. 20%. Should be 10, right? I mean, it, it should be 10. I see no reason why Georgia needs a, a government that spends 20% of your income. 10 seems like a lot to me. Um, it should stop redistributing wealth. It should eliminate regulations. It should privatize the educational system. It should get rid of government schools and, and turn it all to private hands. And, you know, there are ways to do that that make more sense than uh, others. It should get out of our way so that you can go produce and create and build and, and, and create the society you want to create free, freely, voluntarily, without violence against one another. Um, I, would, I think you've already got pretty good police. That's what I've read, right? So there was big police reform in Georgia where the corruption was sucked out of it. So maybe they're corrupt again, so you have to pay them all, fire them all, and replace them, or whatever you have to do. Some countries you have to fire them all and, and, and rehire them. Uh, y you have to get judges that are, that, are ju you know, that are just. But generally, the government just needs to stop doing what it's doing. You have a central bank? Yeah, yeah stop it. <laughs> Don't have a central bank. It's stupid, right? Um, allow, you know, if, 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 you know, allow banks to issue currency freely uh, based on gold or something like that. Uh, you know, you're probably not quite ready for Bitcoin given that it dropped, what, 20% the other day. Uh, so, you know, 
it's, it's not hard. We know what to do. It's nobody wants to do it. It's the will that is missing, not the economic knowledge on how to do it. I mean, you had a government, what was it, 15 years ago that did a lot of good things. And, and deregulated and reduced the size of governments and got out of the way in a lot of ways, right? Not enough, not far enough, but it was taking the steps in that direction. And you've gone in exactly the opposite direction now. Bigger and bigger government, more and more intervention. 20% um, flat tax is better than what you had before. But it should be even lower because government should be smaller. Yeah. So um, what is your argument against... Uh, anarcho-capitalist oh, system. God. Uh, <laughs> because so, uh, you said that government must provide like three things: that is, a militia, police, and. You want to privatize them? No, no, no. I don't want it privatized. But does so if you're against the uh, anarcho-capitalist system where everything is provided by private enterprise, does that mean that uh, government can provide better police than yes. a private? Or yes. Why is that? Um, I, I'm, I'm sighing because I uh, because I uh, the, the I get an anarcho capitalist question every Q and A I ever do, and because I just did a debate in Poland, you can actually find a whole debate that I did in Poland on this issue with an anarcho capitalist. So we went at it for two hours uh, on this issue. Um, so where do you start? Um, there is something called, there is a, a, a sense of what objective justice is. Justice is not a market phenomenon. Um, you know, uh, I, he broke my legs and I want to break his legs. This, this agency says, I'll break his arms too. You give you two for one. And this agency says, I'll just shoot him. Right? And now they're competing for, vo what, what is the competition over, right? You want to have a standard, an objective standard for what is the appropriate punishment for breaking legs. And I don't think a market process is the right process for this particular thing. I, there are lots of things in which markets are not the appropriate pro purpose. We don't, do, we don't decide what's true in science based on markets. We decide based on the evidence, based on experiment, based on the scientific method, right? Uh, markets are good, markets are great, markets are the only thing for wealth and for voluntary exchanges between individuals. But once we get to the non-voluntary, you need a new agency. You need something different, and that's called government. What you need is an entity that establishes an objective set of laws that say, this is what happens if you break somebody's legs. For example, how does he know, how do I know he broke my legs? Maybe you broke my legs. What are the standards of evidence? Right? Have you ever seen like one of these TV shows where they go to court and they analyze? It's difficult to figure out, is this evidence true? Is it right? Is it consistent with the crime scene? Is it not? They're real standards. There's a whole body of law written about that. That is not something that competition can provide and would provide. You need a monopoly on a particular geographic area. I don't believe in one government for the whole world. So I believe in competitive governments, but in different geographic areas. Um, you need one standard for a geographic area where this is the law, this is the standard, this is you know, the, the procedural standards, but this is also what it means to violate somebody's rights. And these are the punishments. Right? I'll give you an example which came to me during this debate that we had. Um, an alcohol capitalist, now I hate an alcohol, the word, because I think it's a contradiction in terms. I don't think you can have capitalism if you don't have government. Government is a necessary good for the establishment of capitalism because government extracts force which allows markets to evolve. Market evolves where force is absence. You can't then have a market in the thing whose absence creates a market. It's logically just doesn't make any sense, and it, indeed it falls apart. All I believe anarchy is is gang warfare, and I, I gave this example. 
which is a kind of a sick example, but it, it really is. It makes me sick, and this is why I get upset at, at the anarchists. Imagine you like having sex with little kids, which I think is sick, right? I think it's sick, and I think you should go to jail if you act on it. But you, in, the, in this anarchist society, have found a protection agency that is okay with it. And maybe you've even found some parents who are okay with you having sex with their kids. I mean, there's sick parents out there, and for not enough money, they'd let you do it. Who's going to protect the kids? They can't afford their own protection agency. Who's going to protect them? Now, in my world, that's one of the roles of government, is to protect children from their parents often, because their pa some parents kids need protection from. Some parents are abusive. Some parents are horrible. So you need government for, for, for these kind of cases. Otherwise, you get just horrific outcomes and weird outcomes. Um, and anyway, I could go, as I said, I, I just did a two-hour debate on this, so we could go on and on and on uh, about lots of examples which would bore most of the people here. Yeah. Uh, so my question is a little bit more specific. Uh, let's say that uh, we have two countries and they both produce the same product. It's almost identical. But one country uh, starts to subsidize it. So the second country mostly imports that product. Yeah. But because of this, the first country uh, loses almost all the factories that were producing that product. Mm -hmm. And the political stance here in Georgia is that we also have to subsidize yeah. because if we don't, we lose those factories. And in the long run, they can jack up the prices because now they have a monopoly. That's right. So what's your strongest argument against that? Or do you think it's right? No, it's an insane argument that economists have refuted a million times. You don't need me to refute it. Any Economics 101 textbook refutes it. I mean, uh, and it was refuted in the 19th century. Uh, it was refuted by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. And, and, and Ricardo uh, in, in the 19th century. So th this, is, this is one of the fallacies that mercantilists uh, advocated for. And this is, I mean... Uh, this is the fallacy that Donald Trump lives by, and he's an idiot, and, and the people advising him a trade are idiots, idiots. So, okay, so you got two countries. One country starts to subsidize product X, and therefore it's cheaper. So this country stops producing product X and imports. How does it import it? Where does it get the money to import it? The, the, you have to export something, probably. Not necessarily, but, but how does it get the money? So how does it get the money to import it? It has to produce something. <laughs> Otherwise it doesn't, right? So yes, yeah, so, so because these guys are subsidizing it, you can get it cheap. Cool, right? I love when other countries are, I mean, I don't really love it because I think it's bad for everybody. But I'll buy subsidized, if you want to subsidize my, I don't know, anything I have, right? If you want to subsidize me the next few days, that's cool. You want to pay my hotel bill? You want to, you know, all the... Right? My, life, my life becomes simpler. Right? So country B now takes the capital that was invested in this product X right, and changes to product Y. And it starts producing product Y. That it either sends, exports to this other country or you know, it's, it's very valuable internally and it creates product Z and product all these other products. And then what happens... What happens to all the money that, is, that comes into this other country because I'm, I'm importing their stuff? They get dollars, let's say. What do they do with those dollars? They either buy my product, or what's the second alternative, which is what China does? Because they don't buy a lot of American product. What do the Chinese do? Buy treasuries? Yeah, why do they buy treasuries? Because it's an investment. Yeah. So, so they buy your stuff. They don't just buy treasuries, they buy hotels, they buy real estate, they buy um, factories, they buy businesses, they buy stuff. Why? Because your economy is thriving. Your economy is doing actually well because you shifted away from product X and you're doing product Y, Z and all these other products. So they are now investing in your economy, all the money, not only are they subsidizing your lifestyle, but they're also then taking the dollars that they got from exporting to you and reinvesting it into your economy. 
In the case of the Chinese, they're keeping interest rates low for Americans by buying treasuries. And they're, they're spending huge amounts of money on, like they bought the Waldorf Astoria for like $2 billion. And the people who sold it to them made a killing. And the Chinese are never going to get their $2 billion back. And the same thing happened to the Japanese in the 80s. They started buying assets in America because they had all these dollars. And Americans did phenomenally well. I mean, I love trade deficits. Trade deficits are amazing. Trade deficits mean what a trade deficit actually means in the case of China and America means that China wants dollars. So they sell us stuff cheap. They get the dollars. Why do they want the dollars? Because they want to invest in America. Now, Georgia, take Georgia, right? If somebody else produces something cheaper than you, don't produce it. Produce the stuff that you can make money off of. Never subsidize. It's never justified to subsidize. Unless it's some kind of national security weapons, something that you have to have for survival. You, the government has to build weapons to keep those Russians at bay, right? But other than that, um, don't subsidize. Create a thriving free economy, but product X. Let, I don't know who's making it. The Russians are making it. They're subsidizing it. Let them make it. And one day they'll jack up prices to take it from you. Then you'll do without that product. Give me an example of a product where this is happening. I mean, there is no product. Gas. Gas is the, probably the only product. Okay. So what's the alternative to Russian gas? Azerbaijani gas. So make sure that you diversify, diversify your sources and have a pipeline to Azerbaijan, right? And because it takes a long time to build, plan in advance. So you're saying that the government should uh, be involved in... No, pipeline. but private businesses would do this, right? So if I'm a, if I'm a private enterprise running a, the electric company in Georgia, and let's assume it's private, really private, not private and regulated and controlled like it is in Georgia and like it is in most of the world, but really private. And I'm dependent on the Russians for gas. And right now the gas is very cheap, but I'm worried that one day they're going to increase their prices by a lot. I'm going to take some of my profits and I'm going to invest them in building an alternative pipeline. The government has no... What, I mean, they are private interests that have much longer term... What, what, is the, what is the time horizon of a politician? How, how far in advance does a politician typically think? No. Four no. years. In Congress, in America, two. Until yeah, until the next election. That's the time horizon. What's the time horizon of a business? People think business short term. Decades. Decades. Decades, because shareholders are, are in this for decades. And what's, what's the value of a share price today? It's a discounted present value of future cash flows, which go in forever. Now, they get... They're smaller and smaller forever because you're discounting them back, but they go on for a long time. So business is far more long-term than government is. So let business take care of these long-term investments. Right? So I'll, I'll give you another example. In, in the U.S., we're afraid of steel. Steel, you know, so national security. Let's assume it was a national security. You need the steel because one day we might go to war and we'll have to build tanks. Unlikely, given we live in a nuclear era, but let's assume we have to build things. So here's my solution. Make the steel industry completely free, but the government pays the U.S. steel industry to keep some plants on mothballs. You know what mothballs is? Ready for production, but not producing. Just keep them there. Right? Pay you a little bit of money. for now. Out of the defense budget, because it's national security. So the defense budget, not economic budget, because the government doesn't do anything in economics. Out of the defense budget, you put some money just so if the can can Canadians decide <laughs> that they're our enemy and they won't sell us steel. I mean, but that's why it's so stupid, because it's funny, right? Who, who, who's, I mean, it's a national security that the Canada won't sell the United States steel, or Mexico, or Brazil. I mean, it's not even about China. China sells the U.S. less than 5% of its steel. Most of it comes from Brazil and Canada and, 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 these other, and, and Mexico, who are not America's enemies or the European Union. So, yeah, I mean, business like to diversify suppliers. If it was private business running the electricity, they wouldn't want to get all their supplies from Russia. But for the government to start doing it, 
It's a disaster. And the worst is when they succeed and then they think they're good at it. You had a question. Yeah. That's fine. Just yell. Just yell. I'll repeat the question. No, no. They're bringing you a mic anyway. Okay. What, what do you think is, uh, should uh, suicide be legal? Should what? Suicide. Kill myself. Do you have a right to your life? What? Do you have a right to your life? Yeah. Who owns your life? Who owns I, you? Me. Then you get to decide okay. when to end it, right? Okay. So the it's second part. None of anybody's business. Okay. If you want to commit suicide. Okay. The second part. How can you have a right to life and not have a right to end it? Mm -hmm. It's like having a right to plot of land and not having a right to sell it. Mm -hmm. Either you own it or you don't own it. It's yours. So should euthanasia be legal? Yes. Okay. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because because. Um, if I'm very sick and I want to die, um, it's very hard to do it yourself. And there should be mechanisms to make it easier for me to make that choice. Is, and as long as the person making the choice knows what he's doing, as long as it's well documented, as long as there's a procedure that, that can then be proved in a court of law that it wasn't murder, it really was euthanasia, you did what the patient wanted you to do, then absolutely, I, th I, I, I think it's, again, I don't think you have a right to life if, if, some, if, some, if a government can tell you, oh, no, no, you have to stay alive and suffer through, you're going to die anyway, so you're going to have to suffer through six months because the cancer is eating you away. I can't think of anything more humane than to let you die. If you choose to, I mean, if you want to suffer, go ahead and suffer. So it, it goes back to if you have a right to life, you have a right to decide what happens to that life, and you have the right to pay somebody in those kind of situations to end it for you, to help you end it. Yeah. Um, should it be? Please, please. Oh, should yeah. Should it be? Should it be illegal to save someone's life from suicide? No, I think you should be able to save somebody's life for suicide, you know, once, because sometimes people do impulsive things and you don't know this might be an impulsive thing. But, uh, but if somebody repeatedly tries to commit suicide, you should stop helping them. So, yeah. Mm, yeah, about monopolies, I was uh, wondering if government isn't to work. Monopolies. Do we need yeah. a government to uh, wake yeah, up monopolies? If government doesn't control the economic sector, how... Businesses will control themselves. They won't. Like uh, someone will take over and just. So in a free market, there's no such thing as monopolies. Yeah, but uh, in some countries there are no free markets. Well, when there's no free market, then you've got big problems. Deal with the problems that create free markets. But in a free market, there are no monopolies. So even in, if a company grows really, really, really big, like. Um, Standard Oil did in the 1870s. It had 92% of oil. What did you learn in Economics 101? Happens when a monopoly owns 92% of all the whatever. What happens? Why, why do we hate monopolies? Prices go up and quality goes down. Well, what's interesting is every monopoly in a free market we've ever looked at as economists, prices go down and quality goes up. Why? Why did Standard Oil lower prices every single year? You can look at the data. Every single year and improve its quality every single year. It had 92% of oil, all the refining capacity in the United States. Why did it do it? Because it knew that competitors could arise at any moment. And if it didn't lower prices, competitors would beat them. And there were competition from other countries. Russia just discovered oil. I think in, in Azerbaijan, not far from here. And there was real competition. Not competition into, that you could see in market share. That's because Rockefeller was so good at keeping prices down that he dominated the market share. But he could only do that because he kept the prices down. If he had lacked staff, 
he would have been beaten. And indeed, between 1870 and 1920, uh, Standard Oil's uh, uh, market share went from 92% to 20. Not because of government, but purely because competition did arise, ultimately. Right? And, the, you know, you don't want government deciding when it's too big, big. When is big too big, right? I don't know. What is, what is bad economies of scale? Right? Let the market decide. If you start producing a lousy product, the market will find a replacement for it. Always. Um, antitrust are the most horrible laws, at least in America, the way they're written. You know, that wants to break up monopolies. You know, you're, you're in violation of antitrust laws if you keep your price too low. Why? Because you're trying to drive out competition, because you, you're what you call dumping, right? Uh, or you're trying to quarter the market. Microsoft, do you know that Microsoft uh, was, was uh, attacked for uh, antitrust? Why? What was it doing that the government didn't like? What's that? No, it doesn't, Microsoft doesn't make PCs. What did Microsoft do to get the Justice Department upset at them? They offered a product for free. And a product you take for granted is free today. Because you're too young to remember the days where we paid for a browser. You know, an internet browser? So Netscape, the first internet browser that was commercial, I, I had to pay $80 for that browser. And you had to renew it. And every new version you had to pay for. Right? And then Microsoft said, if you buy Windows, you get Internet Explorer for free. And the government said, that's, that's no good. That's illegal. You're, you're, you're trying to corner the market. That's bundling. So if you offer a product too cheap, that's no good. What if you offer the product exactly the same price as your competitors? That's wrong because you must be colluding. How are you getting your prices the same? There must be collusion going on. Collusion is when you cooperate. So that's bad. What if you offer a price higher than your competitors? What's that? Well, put aside what happens in the market. What does the government view it? Well, you must be a monopoly, because otherwise, how do you get away with it? You would lose money in a real market, right? So no matter what you do as a businessman, too low, the same, or too high, you're in violation of the antitrust laws. And government loves laws that they can define any way they want at any time. Anybody here read Atlas Shrugged? We've got a few people. You guys should read Atlas Shrugged. So there's a scene in Atlas Shrugged where the government regulator comes to uh, Reardon. And, um, and Reardon said, but I don't, I don't even understand these laws. I don't know. I, you know, anything I do here, it doesn't mean anything. I violate the law no matter what I do. And the regulator says, yeah, what do you think? We want you to follow the law? Government doesn't want you to follow the law. They want you to break the law. Because then they have enormous power over you. Because they can decide when to prosecute you and when not to prosecute you. And if you pay them enough money, they might leave you alone. Like Google has for many, many years paid the government a lot of money. Microsoft didn't pay money, so they were prosecuted. So the idea is to write laws that everybody violates all the time and then cherry pick who to go after depending on whether they play by your rules or not. Because politics is about power. And having lots of criminals out there gives you a lot of power over them. Because you get to decide who's a criminal and who's not. So it's, it's, a, it's a power game. It's not about economics. It's not about right or wrong. It's about political power over our lives. And that's exactly what they want. That's why they regulate the economy and subsidize. Not because they think it's good for the economy. No economist in the world thinks tariffs are good. Except one. Peter Navarro who works for Donald Trump. But politicians ignore all their economic advisors because it's not about economics, it's about power. Unfortunately, that's how the world runs. That's a pretty sour note to end. Do we have another question so we can, uh, yeah, go ahead. Something I can uh, end on a positive. Last question. Yeah. 
I was wondering why socialism is becoming more and more popular in West and in US. Oh, so it's another depressing question. Because, yeah, sort of. Because according to Gallup polls, um, you know, more than 40% of US college students favor socialism over yeah. capitalism. And also it's becoming more and more popular in politics. In yeah, the US. let me, yeah, I get it. So For example, Bernie Sanders, yeah. which is kind so of popular. First, I've got a, you know, the real, the a proper answer to that question is a long answer, which I'm not going to give. Uh, so, but I've got, uh, there's a bunch of my talks on YouTube. By the way, everybody should subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Facebook, Twitter, all of that, but YouTube is the most important. I've got a bunch of videos on YouTube that address exactly that question. But this is the short version. A short version, which I actually talked a little bit about last time I was here at Free University when I talked about the morality of capitalism. We are taught that morality, that being good, that being just, that being noble, being moral, means what? Taking care of other people. It means sharing. It means sacrificing. It means everything that is not self-interested. We're taught that self-interest is evil and nasty and bad and you go to hell for it. So you've got sacrificing for other people, sharing, taking care of everybody else. And you've got self-interest, which is bad. That's good. And self-interest, which is bad. Which, which of those, self-interest or taking care of other people, aligns with capitalism? Self-interest. But our mothers and our preachers and our philosophers have all told us self-interest is evil. So if capitalism is built on a moral system that's evil, what must the capitalism be? Evil. On the other hand, socialism. We've been taught since we were this big. They're taking care of other people. And sacrifice. Sacrifice is good. So some people have to die so that we can achieve the socialist dream. Big deal. It's a sacrifice. We've been taught that sacrifice is noble. Sacrifice is good. They're heroes. It's like the jihadis, right? They die for a cause. So they died for socialism, starved for socialism, right? It's true. There's nothing bad about that. I mean, the bottom line is this. Our ethics that we believe in, almost all of us, the ethics, the moral code, is consistent with socialism. I don't believe in that moral code. I believe in rational, long-term self-interest. I believe self-interest is good and noble. I believe we should be building statues out there for Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and rip down all the ones for politicians and military leaders. Right? What matters in the world is pursuing your life, is making your life the best that it can be. It's choosing the values that are going to make you happy and living the best life that you can live for you. You don't morally owe your life to anybody else but you. I don't believe in sharing. I believe in trading. I don't believe in sacrificing. I believe in trading. I don't believe in being selfless. Why? I love me more than I love you. I do. And I hope you love you more than you love me. Because it's you. And you've only got one life. You've only got one life. So live it. But it's not only human nature, it's, it's just, it's right that you should value what you have, which is your life. So Ayn Rand was uh, uh, the revolution. That, that what makes Ayn Rand interesting, what my, makes Ayn Rand important is that she presents an alternative view of ethics. What makes Ayn Rand important is she presents a vision for living a self-interested life, for living a life of pursuing your own interests, making yourself happy, making yourself successful, and dealing with other people as a trader. Win-win relationships. You want to maximize the win-win, but not as sacrificing. That is a moral code for capitalism. The moral code we have today, called it altruism, the idea that we should live for other people, that's a moral code for socialism. As long as we have the moral code we have, call it the Judo-Christian moral code, we'll get socialism. I just thought I'd bring in religion at the end. <laughs> for fun, right? That, that's what it boils down to. It's, it's about morality. 
and uh, there's tons of content about that. All right, so a few things. One, go read Ayn Rand, Fontenay, Atle Shrugged, The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, Not an Ideal. Uh, uh, we've got a new, uh, new translation of Capitalism, Not an Ideal uh, in Georgian. Pata, is it it's at, in the bookstores? Capitalism? It's, it's also in the library. You have a whole set of Ayn Rand's books in the library. So read Ayn Rand. Uh, follow me on YouTube. We said that, right? Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, the Ayn Rand Institute is holding a conference in February, February 15th to 17th. It's going to be in Prague. But we will pay you to come. Some of you, not everybody. Uh, we, we're going to have scholarships that will pay flights and hotel it's going to be a weekend on Ayn Rand. The, the theme, the topic is going to be uh, individualism in an age of tribalism. So the theme is going to be individualism. We're going to have a bunch of speakers there. I'll be one of them, but there'll be a bunch of speakers there. Um, so uh, the, there's a website. Check AynRand.org, but there is a, uh, there's a website for the conference. You'll be able to apply for scholarships on there. We're working with Students for Liberty to, to make the scholarships available for students uh, in, uh, in Georgia. So I hope a lot of you come. Uh, we're trying to get about 200, 100 to 200 students to come to, to, uh, for a weekend uh, to Prague. Prague's a beautiful city. It's worth coming. February's a little yeah, cold. But, um, but you'll, have, you'll have amazing speakers. And this issue of tribalism is a big issue right now in the world. And, uh, and you guys in the caucuses know something about it. Um, so it's, uh, it's an issue worth, uh, worth discussing and debating. So I hope, I hope some of you show up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Amazon, you can get them, uh, you can get Kindle versions.